Good morning. Welcome to Pleasant Grove United Methodist Church. We sit at the corner of Pleasant Grove Road and Central Pike right here in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. And we've been here for 150 years, praising the Lord. And for those country western singers among you and fans, we're the home of the great late Charlie Daniels. We would like to welcome you this morning. We'll be bringing you songs of praise. Uh, we'll be reading scripture and a great message from our pastor, Brandon. We're sorry we can't all be together here in the sanctuary, but thanks to modern technology, we can still be together. So sit back for the next hour, enjoy, make yourself comfortable, and once again, welcome to Pleasant Grove. Isaiah 62 to 3. The whole earth is wrapped in darkness, all people sunk in deep darkness. But God rises on you, his sunrise glory breaks over you. Nations will come to your light, kings to your sunburst brightness. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hit me with it. Why does God let even the best people die? People have worked their whole lives to make people proud. Wow, why does God let the best people die? They work so hard their whole life. So like, why do, all right, well, well um, death is a part of life. That's, that's the thing, even God allowed God's son to die on a cross. Um, so that is just a part of the life cycle. 
Are you trying to ask, like, why do good people die? I'm trying to ask, why does let God let the best people, like, in my opinion, RBG or people, because she worked so hard for people to be happy and for equality. All right. Well, RBG was very old. Or, not very old, but, I mean, she was older, and that's just, a, again, a part of life. So people die because of, especially, like, with our, uh, with uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she was older, and that's just, that's just part of life. A lot of people ask the question, why do, why does God allow really good people, very young, to die, like innocently? Um, and that's a really good, um, a really good question uh, to, to ask. And one we Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, why did Martin Luther King Jr. allow, allowed to die? Why didn't God stop the assassination? Um, so um, there are. Um, just that's one of the things we don't know about God is like why these things happen. The thing that we do know is that when these horrible things happen, like uh, when people lose their lives, young people lose their lives uh, very innocently, we know and we believe that uh, God will make uh, something good, will bring about something good. And I think it's very appropriate. I want to continue to talk that as we talk about death. Here's a hearse. Passing. <laughs> and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. As you already know, today is the first Sunday in Advent. This is the season, this is the time of the year in the Christian calendar where we prepare ourselves for the comings of Jesus Christ, of our Lord. We remember in about, we're going to remember in about four weeks, a little over four weeks, that how Jesus came uh, as a babe in a manger on his birthday on December 25th. And for these next four weeks, we live into a season of self-reflection and realization that Jesus is coming back again to judge us, to evaluate our lives, to hold us accountable to our faith, to our actions, to how we lived our lives. And so this season is a time where we try to hold ourselves and others accountable to our faith journey and our faith walking. Are we ready would we be ready if Jesus came back again today? Would we be ready to face him face to face and be held accountable for our priorities, for our faith, for our actions? And we've uh, uh, challenged ourselves to take this Advent conspiracy where we want to spend less, give more, and worship fully. And hopefully, uh, since uh, uh, just a few days ago was Black Friday, the, the, the day uh, in America and Western civilization where people flock to stores to buy and to consume, so much is consumed in just one day. It is, it is mind-boggling how much money is spent in one day, and it's also sad about how much money is spent on useless things that could have gone for good, for better schools, for clean water, for all sorts of wonderful life-giving things. And so we've challenged ourselves to 
not get caught up into that. And hopefully you didn't get caught up into that just a few days ago. Hopefully you're not getting caught up into the consumerism, the continued distortion and twisting of what Christmas is really about. And so we're challenging ourselves. And so today I want to talk about one of the things that we're that we're hoping that we can attain, that we can experience this Advent season, and that is to worship fully. And we have this, these verses that were read today uh, to show us what it could mean to worship fully. These verses were the Magnificat, or the Song of Mary, or the Ode of Theotokos, which means the Mother of God. This is the song that Mary sings once she knows and has heard from the angels that she is pregnant with the God child. She's pregnant with the Son of God. And so she breaks out into song. And these events in this song really show us what it's like to worship fully. And so I want to pull out some things that we learn from this song of Mary, the Magnificat, about what it means, how we can worship fully. Hopefully we can apply this this day, this Sunday, but every day, every worship day, every time we worship God, hopefully we can apply these things that we're learning today to make our worship the fullest it can be. The first thing that we learn here in the Magnificat is that Mary is responding to what God has done. See, God has impregnated her through the Holy Spirit, has given her in her womb that promised Messiah, the one that all of Israel is is looking for, is waiting, is anticipating the coming of, of this Messiah, the anointed one, the one that God promised that I'm going to send you this Messiah, this anointed one, and he's going to do amazing and wonderful things in and through my power, and for you, the nation of Israel, the Messiah is going to be wonderful and special because he's sent from me, God. And so the one that all of Israel has been anticipating, been waiting for, anticipating his arrival, is now in her womb. And so she responds to the activity, the movement, the actions of God in praise. She thanks God. She praises God. She has this uncanny ability to see the long-term picture of the consequences of what's the outcomes of what this means, what's growing and developing in her womb. She's able to see all the world-shattering, earth-shattering things that Jesus is going to do. He's just a little itty-bitty speck in her womb, but she knows God has done this wonderful thing. And so she breaks out in praise and adoration and thanksgiving of what God has done in her life. You know, that's what worship this time is all about. It's about looking at what God has done in our world, in our community, in our family own life you know God is always doing something God's healing people all the time God's saving people all the time God's doing all sorts of miracles all the time God is breaking circles of of violence, of abuse, of addictions, of pain. God is breaking those cycles and creating this newness of life, this reorientation of life in people all the time. God is answering prayers all the time. God is, is doing all sorts of things in our lives all the time. And how often do we just stop? And reflect. And we look at what God has done. There's a great old hymn. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. We have many blessings. 
because God has done many things in our lives. So let me ask you again, on this worship day, when you find yourself in worshiping God, how often do you look at what God has done? If we're honest, I think a lot of times we, we look at what God hasn't done. The prayers maybe God hasn't answered. The things that God hasn't done. We look at the pain, the hurt, the anxiety. And we go, God, why haven't you done this, that, and the other thing? When we do that, our, our worship gets skewed. It gets off kilter. It gets corrupted. To worship fully means we look, we take the Sabbath day's rest, and we look back on our lives, on our week. We try to look at all the things that God has done. And when we're able to see the answered prayers, the movement of God, the miracles of God, the actions of God, when we're able to see that and take time to see that, we can't help but rejoice and praise and give thanksgiving to God. So the first step into worshiping fully is to take time to look at what God has done, the activities of God, and give God praise. The second thing that we learn from this song of Mary is that it isn't about a Mary's agenda. It's all about the will of God, the timing of God, what God wants to do. You know, the scriptures say at, at just the right time Jesus came in, into this world. And I'm sure that this teenager, if you asked her, that wouldn't have been her time to be with child. She was a teenager. She was engaged. I bet you she didn't think that was the right time for her to be with child. I bet you she did not have, this wasn't her idea, this wasn't her dream, this wasn't her plan uh, to have a baby from God during engagement out of wedlock. But she was worried about her reputation. What were people going to say about her? What was going to happen to her? She was, she was in jeopardy of being stoned. You could... If she was found without with child with somebody else's child when she's engaged to Joseph, Joseph had every right to have her killed, to have her stoned to death. But Mary was, was like, God, this wouldn't be the time that I've picked, I would pick. This wouldn't be the circumstances that I would I would have to to pick to have during this time. Instead, God says to Mary, this is my time. These are my circumstances. This is my will. And what you hear in this song is Mary singing from her heart through the fear, through the worry, through the untimeliness of this pregnancy, she was singing the hardest song that we can ever sing. Not my will, but yours, O oh Lord. How often do you really truly make worship and everything you do in your life all about God's will, God's timing, and God's agenda. All too often we, we want God to work on our time, to do things in a week or important decision. We, we, 
We want God to, to give us the answer sooner rather than later. Oftentimes we make an agenda and, and then ask God to bless our agenda. But we don't see any of that in the life of Mary and in this song. Her agenda is disruptive, disrupted. Her timing wouldn't be this. But through it all, she sings joyfully. This isn't about me. It's about God's agenda, God's time, and God's will. How often do you pray that prayer? Not my will, not my time, not my agenda, Lord, but yours. And I praise you for your time, for your work, and that your will is being done in my life. The third and the final thing that we learn about how to worship fully is that worship should disrupt us, unnerve us, and make us uncomfortable. Like I said, when Mary is found to be pregnant in the engagement time, Her life was at risk. She was at risk of being stoned to death or being ostracized from her community, being kicked out of her community, not having support, not having love, not having shelter, food, and clothing that was provided by her community, by Joseph. She was greatly unnerved, scared, and uncomfortable. And yet she still praises God. I think one of the biggest issues revolving, or the biggest issues in our United Methodist Church and our, our worship is that worship is very comfortable. From the padded pews we sit in, I'm sure you're very comfortable right now at home in your recliner chair. I, I know I'm gonna be watching that from right there in that comfy recliner with the pillow on my back with a nice cup of coffee and a nice environment. It's gonna be very comfortable for me watching this worship service. My children and my wife are gonna be very comfortable, even my dog is going to be curled up comfortable as we worship. We like the comfort, comfortable physical settings in our churches. We like a nice, comfortable message that isn't too challenging, that maybe makes us feel good about ourselves and having the right belief. Comfortable with the money we put in the plate comfortable with the missions that we do that we've always been doing everything about church today seems that everything that we're doing is comfortable is easy we know it we can anticipate it and can do it flawlessly. Worship and our faith in Jesus Christ is not to be like that. To really worship fully means that God has a demand on our life, has a mandate on our life, and tells us to get up, to get uncomfortable, to go out into this world, this brokenness, this sin-filled world, and do the work of God to help be, 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 help be reconcilers, to reconcile everything back to God, to go to the sick, to go to the poor, to go to the disenfranchised, to be with the aliens, the illegal immigrants, to be with the lowest of the low there. Those are the things that we should be doing. And all of this 
should be heard and proclaimed and preached in worship. And so to worship fully means that we hear these mandates from God on us, this claim of God on us, this call of God on us to go and be found everywhere where Jesus was found. That, that is worshiping fully. That is worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, this triune God. And when we worship fully, it should unnerve us. It should make us uncomfortable. It should claim our lives and propel us outside to go and to do the things that Jesus did all throughout his ministry on this world. Are you, are you worshiping fully? This Advent challenge is, a, is one little way to be able to put yourself in places where you can challenge yourselves, can get uncomfortable, but also that you can experience worshiping fully. May we, on this first Sunday of Advent, may we finally find ourselves worshiping God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in all its fullness. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Pleasant Grove United Methodist Church, the little church with the big heart. We're so glad you worshiped with us. Please come back next week and visit with us. And also, don't forget to share with your friends and family on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks again and have a blessed week.